Okay, guys, I want you to watch this rubber band trick, okay? So I got this normal blue rubber band, okay? So I'm going to put it around my first two fingers like this. Okay, just watch carefully. Nothing fishy going on, just a normal rubber band. And now I'm just going to go pow and look. Let's jump to the other two fingers. And obviously there was a maneuver involved in that, which you can think about. Speaking of maneuvering and jumping around, something that you can think about in your chess games is rerouting your knights to outposts. And this is discussed in the book, simple chess by michael steen and so i'm going to load up a position from that book and if i ask you where's this position from you'd be like oh that's familiar oh i know this yeah i know you know this this is from uh 26 soviet championships 1959 michael versus bronstein exactly guys that's where it's from and so this is a game where tal doesn't do anything spectacular no spectacular sacrifices the game is pretty equal he has the white pieces but all he really does is he makes use of this d5 outpost and so what is an outpost an outpost is a square that you defend with a pawn which cannot be attacked by an enemy pawn okay and so f5 here really isn't an outpost because your opponent can play this move g6 and so one of the things that you want to do in your games or think about doing in your games is to get your pieces to advanced outposts where they can pose threats. And this is effectively what Tao does. And we're going to learn about it in this game. And so in this position, I want you to tell me what move Tao comes up with. And this, by the way, has been reached seven times in the Lee Chess database with everyday players like me and you. And each time the player came up with what Tao came up with. And so what on if you worked it out? Of course, Tao plays this move knight to f1. And the idea being that he is going to reroute this knight to e3 and then try to put a knight on d5. So you might be like, outpost from outpost, who cares about this? If that knight goes to d5, I'm just going to remove it with my own knight. The problem with that attitude is that after e takes d5, excuse me, after e takes d5, this bishop is going to be liberated. It's going to stare at this h7 pawn. Knight g5 is going to be a problem and there's going to be all kinds of tactics. So let me illustrate. After bishop b7, let's say black is just thinking about its own things. Maybe thinking that this diagonal is going to be a threat one day. We have knight to e3, rook on a to d8. The queen doesn't even need to move. We have knight to d5. This queen is hanging here. So let's say you have knight takes d5, e takes d5. And okay, this knight on c6 doesn't need to move because the rook is eyeing up the white queen. However, black has other problems. For example, this e5 pawn is hanging. Knight g5 could be a problem attacking this h7 square. And so you can study this on your own, but something like f6 is a huge blunder. So let's say you play some move like bishop f6, okay? This dark square bishop plays the role of a big pawn for the time being. Then in this position, white can just go ahead and play knight g5 anyway, attacking this h7 square. If you take, then this bishop is then gonna attack this rook here on d8 which is going to be awkward because that rook is needed to apply a pin here on this pawn and so in this position maybe what many players in this position would do is just play a move like h6 try to remove the knight but now you have say queen d3 threatening mate in one let's say you have g6 and now you want to pause the video work out a spectacular move that white can play well on if you did is of course knight takes f7 you do your tactics puzzle the whole time rook takes f7 queen takes g6 check and in this position, if the king moves here, we have bishop takes h6 check. If the king moves here, we're just going to pick up the rook. And so the only thing that black can do is play bishop to g7. And, well, white is in a completely winning position. And so this is what can happen if you're not paying attention to this d5 outpost and you're just allowing a white knight to get there. And so Bronstein actually calculates a lot of this stuff and plays the sensible move the top engine move in his position which is bishop to e6 okay and so now we have knight e3 rook on a to d8 and in this position now knight to d5 just blunders a pawn and you don't get any compensation for it so as an example if you play knight to d5 now you have knight takes d5 e takes d5 rook takes d5 the queen is hanging queen e2 and now f5 black is just up a pawn there is no threat black is just in a winning position Okay, so Bronstein has good control over the position after rook on a to d8. But the queen has to move, queen e2. And in this position, Bronstein goes for g6, trying to activate the, the king. Maybe h6 is a better move preventing knight to g5. Okay, and so now we have knight to g5. And in this position, we have c4, which is a really interesting move. Okay, so a lot of this game has been around this outpost here on d5. But what has Bronstein done by playing this move c4? He's created his own outpost here on d3. And so obviously this is a square that cannot be attacked by a white pawn. And if white plays too passively in this position, 
then black can execute maneuver like knight to c7 sorry d7 c7 and then d3 and so i think tal thinks about this for a while and he plays this move a4 i think many of us certainly i would just play some move like knight takes e6 you have f takes e6 that is the top engine move and now you have these double isolated pawns on the e-file you try to trade down you try to win in an end game however the downside of doing that is then that d5 outpost is lost forever and so tal opts against this and plays this move a4 probably thinking about this d3 outpost thinking about breaking up this structure and maybe even thinking that this bishop is kind of useless here anyway it's not really an active piece it's just staring at its own pawn chain and here black cannot really engage cannot move this pawn because then the c4 pawn would be hanging and so we have king g7 a takes b5 a takes b5 rook b1 the idea is that tar wants to play this move b3 and so in this position how do you prevent that you have knight to a5 from bronstein and so now b3 is out of the question that just blunders a pawn you have three attackers of that square and only two defenders and so we have knight to f3 and now the e5 pawn is hanging queen c7 defending it and now finally tau uses this opportunity to play this move knight to d5 so he's waiting for that opportunity he gets it now and many of us in this position would instinctively play a move like knight takes d5 However, this leads to problems. After e takes d5, bishop takes d5, we have knight takes e5 with a threat of winning a pawn here on g6 because after knight takes g6, we would launch a double attack on this e7 bishop. So instead of playing knight takes d5, Bronstein goes for bishop takes d5. And now after e takes d5, if Bronstein went with knight takes d5, knight takes e5 is not as threatening because this bishop is double defended and so instead in this position Bronstein plays this really interesting move rook to e8 and he's effectively saying well if you want to pick up this pawn you're going to have to do it via queen exchange maybe he's trying to liquidate this position remove the threats play for a draw and so what's the problem with playing knight takes e5 in this position well it's going to create this discovered pin here with this move bishop to d6 now this knight is triple attacked and it cannot move because the queen is in line so you're forced to play this move f4 and let's say knight takes d5 this pawn is hanging and if you turn on the engine white is in a completely losing position and so if tau wants to pick up this pawn he has to do it via the queen which is what he does queen takes e5 queen takes e5 knight takes e5 okay we have a queen tray knight takes d5 and now what tau really wants to do is play this move knight c6 exert pressure here on this rook and on this bishop However, this knight is guarding that square, so he plays this move rook to a1. We have rook, excuse me, knight to b3. Knight to b7 appears to be a blunder because of bishop b4. You can look into it. That is obviously a pin that you don't want to really walk into. And so Bronstein goes for the safe move, knight to b3. But now we have bishop takes b3, c takes b3. We have, obviously have this horrible structure here, which is going to be a factor in this game. And now you want to pause the video and work out the spectacular move that Tal played. Well done if you worked it out. It is the move bishop to h6 check. And in this position, if Bronstein decides to take this bishop on h6, we have knight takes f7 check. The king retreats. Knight takes d8. And now rook takes d8 is forced. You can't play bishop takes because the rook is hanging. So you have rook takes d8. And in this position, it looks like you've traded equal material. However, you are going to lose these pawns because of rook a5 attacking the pawn if you play rook to b8 then you can attack the bishop which is only defended once and it's pinned if you have a move like king f6 then you have rook d7 and this knight is hanging and it's basically gg white is just completely winning black is lost and so maybe bronstein sees a lot of this and doesn't go for the trade instead just retreats the king back to g8 we have knight to c6 the rook is hanging we have rook c8, rook d1, takes, takes. And now you notice that this b5 pawn is hanging. But what else is hanging, guys? You notice, right? This bishop is a free bishop right now, okay? If it's white's turn, white can obviously take this bishop. The black rook cannot take because otherwise it would be a simple mate in two. And so obviously, Bronstein has to protect his bishop. Plays this move f6, protects against the mate threat. But now we have rook takes b5 g5 and now rook takes b3 and after all is said and done white is up two pawns white has these connected passes i provide a link to this game in the description below 
and uh, tile does convert from here no no grandmaster is going to blow it from here and so what i found really interesting about this game is that there's nothing really spectacular about this okay it's a equal position but what tile effectively does is after this position has been reached he has a very very simple game plan which is that he's going to move his knight to f1 to e3 and then bide his time and go for this d5 outpost and what's also interesting is that when Bronstein tries to create his own outpost by playing his move c4, but creating his outpost on d3, Tal does try to break it up with this move a4. And so this is something that you can think about in your games when you're playing, when there's no obvious tactics, when there are no weak pawns to target, is just to think about, okay, where are the outposts in the game? Where could you create a possible outpost and try to aim for it and try to use that to create problems for your opponents? Hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for your time.